Amen. So does anybody know the dog whisperer? The dog whisperer, I think his name's Caesar Milan. He's, so he's really, really popular, had a show for like 10 years. And you watch him basically um, train dogs into absolute submission. Amen? It's wonderful to watch him do that. And um, you just get to see this process as he trains the dogs. And it's just something thrilling to watch when he's got all the dogs around him. And he gives a command. And they all obey instantly. And we look at that, we're like, that's pretty great. And so us dog owners, we want to have that ability in our own life. Amen? But also, when you look at the relationship, let's let's overanalyze this for a second. When you look at the relationship between him and the dogs, it looks so peaceful, doesn't it? Because he's in absolute control. And they're all absolutely obedient. And as a man... He looks, as a man, very respectable and strong because he's in absolute control. And what we really want to do is we want to call the dog whisperer to come train us as parents so that we can get our kids into that level of compliance. Some honest person say amen to that. Amen. Because we would love that, would we not? But here's the shocking biblical truth of it all. Our kids are not dogs. Amen? I'm just going to let that sit there for a second. Our kids are not dogs. And we could just pray and say amen and be done. But our kids are eternal souls made in the image of God with uncalculable worth and value. And they are hearts for us to shape, not people whose compliance we demand. It's a very different thing to raise a child versus a pet. (laughs) Here's Here's a quote from the Urban Dictionary, which I do not recommend this website at all, by the way. But this was just funny. Um, It it defines, because I said so, as an imperious reply that an authority figure, most often a parent, impatiently tells someone under his or her care when he does not wish to admit that it is literally no good, that he has no literally no good valid reason why said dependent should have to comply with the directive but the authority figure doesn't want to admit it. Is any of that familiar at all? So when we're in a conflict with our child and we have that moment when we say, because I said so, that's kind of what we're doing. Now, the audience for this, you might be thinking, well, I don't have young kids at home. Um, Challenge yourself for a moment. If you've got kids, no matter what their age is, this is good for you today. But also, what if you're grandparents and you've got those grandkiddos? You still have influence, amen? Amen. If you're a Sunday school teacher, you have influence. If you're a school teacher, if you're a coach, if you're an employer today, you have influence. And again, you're not just after compliance with those people around you. You are dealing every day with eternal beings made in the image of God. So how do you have that influence in a healthy way? So that's what we're going to explore today. And here's a disclaimer too. Um, As we go into this, whenever we do parenting, by the way, it's it's always especially risky. It's especially risky for us coming to a, a discussion like this and saying, yeah, I'm so glad my spouse is with me today. Get him, pastor. Or I'm going to go right home and I'm going to share this link with them, get him pastor. This, this kind of truth, it's not meant to be a club with which to beat up anybody, especially not you guys here today. The truth that we're going to explore today is meant to give us a three-dimensional, refreshed view of the grace of God toward us so that we can give that grace toward our children. I think it's going to humble us today but it's not meant to beat you up. And I just want to acknowledge many of us are coming from different places today and some of us are coming from a very broken place and and we're feeling nervous already that this topic has been introduced because you're like, Pastor, you don't know what I've come from. 
You don't know what I've, you don't know what I've overcome already just to get here. And I just want to encourage you, we're going to walk through this very tenderly, very carefully. The only true teacher for you today is the Holy Spirit. He knows where you've come from. He knows right where you're at. And he knows the timing at which you should take some of these steps. Last disclaimer, I am not perfect at parenting. The reason I brought up the dog whisperer is because that was my dream for parenting. I absolutely relate to that. If you could turn the clock back and get to know the me that was when my kids were super young, if I'd have been teaching parenting classes at that time, almost all of it would have been strategy for compliance. God's done a work in me, so I'm not here to condemn you. Because I said so. If you took that phrase, because I said so, and you have an interaction with your kids and a conflict with your kids, and you verbalize, well, because I said so. When you do that, I propose to you, many of us mean different things in that phrase, because I said so. Like if we had a, a, a Google translator, it would translate for a lot of different ones of us what we're actually saying. So for the hurt parent, what we're actually saying when we say because I said so is we're saying, I wish you would be kinder to me and just comply. I feel like you're trying to attack me and that you don't care about me. When we say because I said so, we're just saying, would you just comply, please? Next, the hardcore parent. I learned to follow orders without ever asking questions. I think it worked for me, <laughs> so it should work for you. Come on, military people, where are you at? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> the drill sergeant was good enough for me. Why isn't it good enough for you? They're made in the image of God. They're eternal souls. We are given the privilege to help shape them. The triggered or exhausted parent sometimes says, because I said so, meaning I've reached my limit. Please stop fighting so that I can have peace. I'm so desperate for peace. I don't, want, I don't have the strength to argue or to explain. I'm just so desperate for peace right now. Have you ever been there? The fearful parent, when you don't comply, I feel like a parenting failure, and I'm scared that I'm raising you wrong. And last, the wise parent, please trust me. In some moments, you'll need to just trust me. That's the wise parent. And I, I still would recommend, if, if you're the wise parent today, be very careful when you say those words. Sometimes, sometimes they're going to be out in the street and you're going to need to say, go back or stop. And you're going to need to say, I don't have time to explain. Just trust me. Those moments will happen. Amen, parents? Those moments will happen. But here's the deal. That should be the one in a hundred you're like, you don't know my kid. But it should be the one in the hundred. And here's why. Every other time, the other 99, we should be trying to explain the why. Because we're training them up in the ways of the Lord. And we should be explaining and over-explaining and knowing that it leaks and re-explaining again. Why? So that when the 100 comes and we have to say, just trust me they'll know how unique of a moment this is. And they'll trust you. I'm not making that as a guarantee. I'm saying you definitely increase the likelihood. <laughs> the second piece in life, you need to follow authority even when you don't think that authority is good, wise, or right. I'm teaching you authority not for my own ego. I'm teaching you authority because someday there's going to be a policeman and you're going to have to respect them. There's going to be a professor. There's going to be a coach. There's going to be a boss. And I need to teach you this kind of right relating that's part of your training. It's not because I need it. So here's the question. Of all those types of parents, and we, we translated them all, which of those are you? <laughs> Depends on the day, doesn't it? <laughs> 
I think we all spend time in and out of all of those. Here's a verse for you. Proverbs 22, 6. It says, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now that, for some of us, I just say this really quickly. That for some of us has been used dysfunctionally as some kind of absolutist promise to Christian parents that if we read the Bible to our kids, they'll never leave Jesus behind. That's not what that verse is saying. What it's suggesting to you is you do the best you possibly can to set them along the path. And once they've tasted the path of Jesus, that will be compelling to them throughout their life. They'll still make their own adult choices. But I think we get hung up on the second piece and we forget the first piece. And the first piece is the job description of parents is we are called to train up our kids, not to guarantee their compliance with our every wish, to train them up. That's a lot of talking for you talkers, right? I'm going to train them in all the things. And Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 says it like this. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. And he means the commands of God. He means the core tenets of the faith. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Teach your kids the way of Jesus. I thought the Sunday school teacher was supposed to do that. Not according to the Bible. Moms and dads, this is our job to train up our kids and to show them the way of Jesus. It's our job. And and what that means is if we're going to train them, it means there's going to be lots and lots and lots of telling them what to do. Amen? Amen? Clean your room. It's nap time. Go to bed and stay in your bed. (laughs) You might not close your eyes. You might not like it. You might not actually go to sleep. Just go to your bed because it's nap time. Uh, You may not hit your sister in the face. You may not scream at the top of your lungs at the store. Again, you may hate the store. You may be miserable in the store. Those are all your choices. But you may not scream at the top of your lungs. You need to tell the truth. You need to respect your mother and your father. You need to do those things. Truth is absolutely pivotal. We're going to church together. No, we're going to church together. It's important that we sit under the scripture together. These are the things that we're going to do. And all of this, lots and lots of telling them what to do can lead to conflict. Amen. But Ephesians 6, 1 says it like this, says, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. So the job description of the parent is to train up their children. The job description of the child is to obey. That's what they're to do. It doesn't mean they'll do it, but it's what they're supposed to do. And and, and often in the scripture, we'll talk about this next week on Mother's Day, children are told to obey their parents. Adult children are not commanded to obey their parents. We're commanded to honor our parents. And so that's what we'll get into next week. So it it is their job description to obey for sure. But let me ask you this question just for the purpose of humility When you look back at your own job performance as a child growing up in your own parents' house, how good were you at obeying? Scale of 1 to 10. Does that humble you a little bit with your kids? It does for me. Second question, when you look at yourself and your own track record of obeying the voice of God the Father in your life, The way of Jesus. Scale of 1 to 10, how you doing? Not for the purpose of judgment, but does it humble you? I think it should. A little less dog whisperer, maybe. A little more grace toward them, because they came from you. So in how we train them, the way we do it matters. So here's some verses about the fact that it matters. Ephesians 6 verse 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way that you treat them. 
Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. So this is another really core concept in Scripture. It's, we're not just told to train them and tell them what to do. The way that we do it matters. And I got two scriptures for you. Colossians 3.24, fathers do not embitter your children or they will be discouraged. I find it interesting both of those verses are directed at dads. I'm not going to read any more into that. It's just there. <laughs> the way that we do it should not be a constant stir of anger in the home. It should not lead to their bitter posture toward us or their discouragement that we are impossible to please. It shouldn't lead to that. So sometimes we say, because I said so to those kids, and, and, and in those interactions, those, those precious interactions, we, 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 we say those words. And what happens, let me give you the consequences just really quick. When we say those words to our kids, there's some things that happen. Now, I didn't make a slide uh, about this. If you want these later on, uh, Facebook me or something, and I'll get them to you. But the very first one that, thing that happens, when you say, because I said so, here's the first dysfunctional thing. It makes the conversation into a competition of wills instead of a partnership. Because I said so is me taking a superior authoritative role and saying you should just comply. And then it's a question of who wins the competition. And then that language starts to come into our homes, doesn't it? Who won that fight? It's not a partnership. The next thing that happens is we create misunderstanding by saying, because I said so, what we're saying is, I won't give you the vision or the reason or the logic behind what's going on right now. And we create a vacuum of information. And do you know what happens with a vacuum of information almost every time? We fill the vacuum with the darkest possible motive. Think about when your politicians don't tell you why they do a certain thing. Do you ever fill the vacuum with the darkest possible motive they could have? How about your teachers? How about your bosses at work when they don't tell you why you're doing the thing? How about your pastors at your church when they don't tell you why you're doing a particular thing? You take that vacuum and we do really dark things with it, right? All the time. And your kids do the same thing. By you expressing the why... You're actually helping them understand. Not only are you training them, but you're, you're making them partners with you. You're also humbling yourself and treating them like equals. Next one is that you model disrespect. You model impatience. I don't have time for your questions. I don't have time to give an explanation. And then the last thing is we give them a wrong view of God. And this is the most destructive aspect of when we say, because I said so, is we give them the wrong view of God. Psalm 103, 13 says, The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. This is the way that the Lord is. He's like a father. It's always interesting as a pastor, you, you, you preach anything on, on God being our father and he's like a father. You should trust him because he's like a good father. I will always have people come up after the sermon's over and say, yeah, pastor, but if you knew my father, you wouldn't say that to me. You'd say God's like somebody else, not like my father was. Here's the choice we have as parents. Will we emulate who God the Father really is to them? Because that's what we're called to do. That tender and compassionate part. Not that impatience, I don't have time for you. We're going to get into that a little bit more. So how do we do this positively? How do we do this? How do we train our kids? The first way is you've got to make their choices clear. Make their choices clear. This happens right away in the book of Genesis. God comes to the very first man and woman. It's the very first family scenario in, in history is right there in the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve are the first children. God is the first father, amen? And in that scenario, what does the perfect heavenly parent immediately do to the first two children? He gives them options. He lays out the choices before them, and he tells them what the consequences will be of the wrong choice. 
So what does it say? Genesis 2.15, but the Lord God warned them, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. What's interesting is we already know the end of the story. They don't obey, right? But God does not do things to enforce their compliance. Why? Because God is in the heart-shaping business, not the compliance business. So we got to model respect as an equal to them. Proverbs 15, 1. A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. One of the things that happens in our interactions with our kids sometimes is, is they'll get frustrated with us and then we'll get extra frustrated with them and then they get extra frustrated with us. And how did the volume get to this level in our house? Because it always does. You see what the proverb says. This is a brilliant parenting verse, by the way. It says, you want to deal with anger? You need a soft answer. You be the one that takes the volume down. And when you're the one who takes the volume down, there's respect in that, right? I don't have to overpower you right now. Overpower is an interesting word. There was a, there was a situation between my dad and my older sister. And I'm going to walk very carefully through this because I love my dad and I would not want to dishonor him. But he had a day that was not a good day. Some of us have had days that weren't good days in our parenting. <clears throat> and he wanted my sister to go somewhere. She did not want to go. She expressed it with a lot of volume that she did not want to go. And it escalated. And it escalated to a place where he physically forced her, essentially, to go. And I was very young. And I remember watching this episode take place. And I didn't know much. I just knew there was instinct inside of me that knew what I'm witnessing right now is not good. He did not abuse her. There were no marks that were left. I don't mean anything like that. But it wasn't a good day. And I'll be real. He lost some things with me that day in my relationship with him. And if you've been here for a while, you know I love my dad. Lost him a couple years ago to cancer, and um, he did a whole lot of repair work and a lot of growth as an individual. But sometimes we get caught in some situations where we're tempted to not treat that person as an equal. I'm so after the compliance that we find ourselves doing things. So let me give you a counter story. Linda Trueblood, who's the most amazing mom you've ever seen in your life. My wife. And I remember there were situations, Linda's talked about this before, premarital counseling, we talk about this. She's, she's very, very open about this. But one of her big struggles is, is with temper, with anger. Sometimes it gets out of control. Three little ones running around the house, all with sippy cups in their hands. You know what I'm saying. Anger was a thing sometimes, and sometimes it blew up, and sometimes she said some things that she didn't want to say. But here was the shocker. Linda Trubla did this thing where she would come back to the kids, and she would confess her sin to them after she'd calmed down. And she would ask them for forgiveness. Do you know how respectful it is to a child? to ask their forgiveness. You cannot make an apology to somebody or ask their forgiveness without fundamentally changing the relationship because it goes just like that. You don't have to say equality. Equality is what happens, is they become a human being worthy of respect in an instant. And she brought that into my home and I'll be forever thankful. I'd never seen it done before. It was absolutely amazing. And she changed it because what she became in front of our kids is she became a broken child of God who receives his grace just like you. And she modeled grace. Oh, yeah, Linda Trueblood, I could go on. 
you got to model respect. Next, you got to model kindness. And this is where you explain the why to them. You have to explain the why. You're like, but that takes time. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. One of the, the wake-up calls for some of us today may be that this parenting thing takes a whole lot more work and time than maybe we signed on for, but it does. If we're going to do this well, you've got to explain all the things. We had this rule with our kids that screens were limited. We called them screen time. We called it screen time. And it was, it was any of the game systems, any of the iPads, any of the TVs that you were going to sit down in front of it. There was a timer. You had this much time on the day, and then you were done. And we were the worst parents in town. Worst. They told us daily how bad we were. And some of you in the room, you're with me, and you're like, because I said so, darn it. Nope. Explain why. Tell them why. Because I want you to play in the dirt. Because I want you to have neighborhood friends. Because I want you to build a fort. Because I want all these wonderful things to be part of your growing up life, and none of them can happen in front of a screen. I don't care how high depth the screen is. <laughs> and man, they fought us. But we kept just trying to say, this is why, this is why, this is why. And when they become ba ba became babysitters later on, and they saw some kids who didn't have that kind of guideline in their life, they came back to us and said, Mom and Dad, we're so thankful. Thank you. I'm not trying to be judgmental. It's the why that's important. Clean your room. Clean up after yourself. Take your plate to the sink. You can do that. You've got legs. Come on, let's go. Why? Because someday you're going to be somebody's college roommate. And I don't want you to be that roommate. <laughs> and then after college, you might be somebody's spouse. And I definitely don't want you to be that spouse. Does it mean you've got to be Martha Stewart perfect? Of course not. That's not the point. The point is be a good citizen, be clean. We've got reasons behind these things. When's the last time you told your kids why they were doing what they were doing? We're called to train up our children in the way that they should go. You've got to tell them why. And when you do, you're communicating respect to them. Next, when they comply, you've got to thank and encourage them. And again, this can sound weird to us. I don't have to thank them for obeying. Weirdly, when Jesus gets baptized according to the command of God the Father, guess what God the Father does? He comes out and says, this is my son whom I love and I'm well pleased with him. He says, thank you to Jesus and affirms him. If God the Father's doing that with his son, why aren't we doing that with our kids? So this is, it's like, again, it, it does this equality thing. When we express gratitude to them for, for even obeying what we've told them to do, when we express gratitude, it equalizes us. Now, what happens if they don't comply? You're like, this sounds more like my house now. <laughs> then you give a consequence. Proverbs 3, 11 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke. Because the Lord disciplines those that he loves as a father, the son that he delights in. Notice again the motives of God in his discipline. Those should be our motives when we do this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on consequences today, but especially if you've got young ones at home, you know this is a whole area of study. It's a whole area of learning for you. I've actually preached in depth on this in the past. I'm not going to go super deep on it today. I will just say these should be your motives when you do this. There's a little window into the how. Do it consistently. Don't promise a consequence and not follow through. It's going to hurt you so much. Do it without anger and without emotion. Do not take their non-compliance personally. It's not a personal reflection of how you're parenting. Detach from that. Because if you feel like it's some kind of a reflection on you and your success level, you will bring more severe consequences. Don't do that. Next, do it lovingly and explain to them, we're back talking again. 
explain to them the connection between the consequence and the choice that they made. Special note on teens, and i got to fly through this. Mm. Okay, teens, just real quick. Much of your kids' life, you play the sheriff. means you're doling out tickets all the time to them, right? Like it just feels like your full-time job. But as they approach the teenage years, you start to slow that down. It's fewer consequences. It's much more advice. It's much more love and affirmation and guidance. I call it the coaching uh, phase of parenting. And a lot of the consequences that they do face will come from life. And when they ignore your counsel, and they will, and when they go out into life and they do something foolish and they face the consequence for that, then what do you do? You're waiting on the front porch and you welcome them down the road. The prodigal. You can't wait. You're ecstatic. You throw a party. That means full grace, full love, full acceptance. And by the way, you never left the porch. You never left the porch waiting. That's how much you love them. And if you can love them like that and show that grace and acceptance, what will they learn? They'll learn that they're safe in your relationship. I can screw up for the rest of my life, and Dad will still love me. Amen? They'll learn, number two, that bad choices don't instantly make us terrible people. Gosh, don't we hope that's true as people. We hope our bad choices don't instantly make us terrible people. Don't let that lie exist for them. Number three, when they ignore our good counsel, it can lead to painful results. We do want them to learn that. And number four, maybe God also has grace for them in their sins. Maybe God still loves them when they make mistakes. Because what are we doing there? See, we're modeling grace so that they might believe in God's grace. The number one thing that we are trying to do in our parenting is to parent them the way the Father in heaven parents us. If you've got any questions, if you've got any concerns about any of this, just boil it all right down to that. If I can see God the Father doing it, that's valid parenting. And if my parenting doesn't look like his in the scripture, it's time for my parenting to adjust. Because I want it to look like that. Amen? Amen. 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 So how does, how does God parent us? Number one, God encourages discussion. I don't have a slide for some of this. God encourages discussion and negotiation, does he not? And some of us are struggling with that for a quick second. Let me just take you mentally to Abraham for a second. And God said, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham said, what to God? What if I find a hundred good people. Will you you stop then? And then they start negotiating back and forth, don't they? And God encourages the negotiation. Why does God encourage the negotiation? Because Abraham's growing up, and that's the whole point. It's not about compliance. It's about shaping a heart. That's what the Father does with us. Let's do that with our kids. Next, God builds trust, not fear. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment, and the one who fears is not made made perfect in love. God starts as a sheriff, too, with some of us. But man, as quick as we can possibly move into the direction of love and trust instead of fear, that's what God's all about. Let's do that with our kids. Next, God is humble and gentle. Jesus said this, Matthew 11, 29. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls Next, God usually explains the why. This should just get you. John 15, 15. Jesus says this, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I've told you everything that the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. Because I said so doesn't explain. Jesus comes to his disciples and says, hey, it's, it's masters with slaves that don't explain. I explain to you. He explains the parables to them. He gives them the whole model of what God is doing in redemptive history. 
Every single time Jesus does something, he stops and says, do you know what I was doing there? And he invites them in. This is the way God leads. Let's lead like this. Let's lead like that. And then finally, God's grace is greater than our failure. And that's what the prodigal son teaches us. God's grace is greater than our failure. Amen? Amen. He waits on the porch. That's how he parents. He gives the son the option. The son takes the option, sadly. The son goes and faces the life consequences over it. The son comes back, and he's waiting, and he can't wait, and he's not judging, and he's not bitter. He's just ready to welcome him back inside. Let's be that way. Hmm. Jake Trueblood's my firstborn. We took a picture of every single move he made. And I've got them all for you. And video. And everything's so special with that firstborn. And he's so strong. He's also our experimental child because he's our first and you make all your mistakes because you're trying stuff out on that first one. And he's in therapy right now. He'll be okay. (laughs) We pray for the therapist. (laughs) Poor fella. (laughs) Jake's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, When Jake was 13 years old... um, God had to come and rebuke me because I saw some things in him I'd never seen before. I was waiting for Jake to become a man. I was waiting for him to develop some strong character. And God had to peel the veil back because I was so stubborn, so blind, and showed me in an instant just who my son had become already at 13 years old. And I about broke down at who he already was the kind of leader, the kind of metal he had. And I had to start walking with my son like the man of God that he was. And instead of trying to force his compliance at 13, I had to start trying to say, God, can can I have part, maybe maybe a little bit of of, uh, uh, ownership in, in shaping this incredible young man? I had to change my tone. Does that make sense? Jake and I are close today. Jake's an amazing guy. He went into GSM, our youth group here, and people started to say to me, you know what, if there's a new kid in GSM, if we could just get them talking to Jake, Jake will adopt them and make sure they're okay the whole rest of the night. And when they told me, I didn't know that. But see, God had done that work in my son. Davey, we're in the birthing room. Davy, little redhead, beautiful girl. And she's crying in the birthing room, and nobody can calm her down. And they invite me over, and I take her in my arms, and she immediately quiets down as soon as she hears my voice. And I mean, she had my heart wrapped around her for the rest of her life at that point forward. Davy, she got the super geek gene from me, so that makes me proud of her. Um, She overanalyzes everything like I do. Her faith is so deep. She's a very internal processor. She would come into the kitchen and just ask me questions about faith, about things she was struggling with. And these questions, man, they had an edge to them, and She forced me to think through some of the things about my own faith I hadn't thought through before. She forced me to find some of the answers I'd never found before. And and some of us just say to our kids, again, because I said so, or we say, well, just have faith. And and sometimes we're a little bit lazy with our kids, and sometimes we don't give them the kind of effort. And go read a book, Mom and Dad, and help them. We need to do that. And I can tell you, Probably the best sermons I've ever preached in this church are because of a question that Davy put to me. She forced me to. And then Gracie, you can't handle Gracie. 
Gracie comes out with this curly hair and a curly personality. And she's got this, she's got this just brilliant smile and she stares into the video camera and just screams at you. And that was always her and, and, and just amazing confidence and always free and just knows who she is. And, and I can't even hardly relate to that. I, I wasn't that way when I was her age, but she just is. And I've seen Gracie face things that I wanted to rescue her from. And I promised her yesterday that I would not tell stories about Gracie because she's still here at this church. But I'll just tell you a little. <sighs> we'll keep it general. But I've seen Gracie face things. And when I saw him coming... I wanted to run to her defense and I wanted to protect her from it and I wanted to choke some people in her school if I could just say that. And I didn't and I held back and I just saw her with every single challenge just rise, just rise, just rise. And just, and she grew and she's strong. And she's a leader. and She will be the leader of the free world someday for sure and nobody is more of a cuddler in my family get on the couch and she just piles herself onto you and she's amazing Linda and I know we talk about it we're like she is the compassionate center of our whole family if anybody's going to feel compassion about a situation first it's going to be Gracie see I've got my three I love them more than you know God looked at Adam and Eve, his very first children, but also the very first parents, didn't he? And he treated them like royalty. And one of the royal gifts he gave to the very first man, the very first woman, is he gave them the royal ability to pass down their line, didn't he? And the genes passed down, we're like, oh, I've got my eyes. And so great when we see the good things pass down, isn't it? But that channel works the other way too. And sometimes we see some of our bad stuff flow down. And some of it's, some of it's the stuff that we've modeled. And that's the heartbreaker for me as a dad. I said in the beginning, I'm not perfect at this. Teaching a message like this to you, I get a little frustrated with God about it. Because I'm like, I wish I could just close the book on parenting and just be done with this and not think about this anymore because I don't want to go back and think about that. And I've got I've to reflect and I've got to bring this to you about parenting, but it's painful because I know some of the things that I've done wrong with my kids. Can I just tell you that? And I restir some of that stuff up and I'm like, oh God, have mercy on me, God. Have mercy on me because I can... I can think and I can list off to you all the ways that I have not modeled and I have not explained and I have not respected them appropriately. There's so many, so just, there's just so much of that. And what it really amounts to at the end of the day is I've held up law to them and said, you've got to comply with what I tell you in order for me to be happy with you. And that's the worst thing I've ever shown to my kids because that's not our gracious God. He's all about amazing grace and he loves us no matter what. And for every day that I didn't show that to them, I need his grace. Okay, so there's the flip, right? Did you see it? I am the recipient of his grace. I am the prodigal as their father. I'm the one who needs to come back. I'm the one who needs to find him on the front porch. I'm the one who needs to say, now that I've thought about all this today, God, I need a whole different layer of forgiveness for me. And I need you to humble me. And I need to surrender. And I need to be a recipient of your grace. And I need to model that for them. God, help us today. Amen. God, help us. Would you stand? All the moms and dads, all the teachers, all the business owners, all the grandparents, all the coaches, 
everybody. Could our legacy be grace? Let's pray, Lord God. There's so much that we talked about today and it's it's a little bit too much. So what we're gonna do right now in this moment is we're gonna ask you, Holy Spirit, ever present, would you come and speak to our hearts right now? Would you whittle this all down to the one thing, the one thing that we need to hear? Lord, would you speak to us what we need to walk in? Maybe there's something to just stop being so stubborn about from now on. Maybe there's something to surrender. Maybe there's something, a new strategy in the home to try. Maybe there's an apology that we need to give. Holy Spirit, you are over all of these things. X-ray our hearts. Give us the power to walk in them. We love you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.